Welcome back to CST432. Today we will talk about loss in translation, not. If you remember what we have talked about previously, there are some different available languages for the next. First of all, the default language NextG is based on Next Bytecode or NBC, which runs on a virtual machine on the ARM processor. Now, the virtual machine acts as a translator between the Next Bytecode and the ARM object code. So this introduced an overhead into the execution of the program on the microcontroller. Now if you can bypass the translation, this results in a more efficient and precise communication of what we intend to do. In other words, instead of going through uh, speaking in English to speaking in French and then finally uh, reaching an audience that is only understands Japanese, it would be much better if we can speak through uh, directly in Japanese to the audience. Some of the key concepts that we will cover in this module includes instruction sets, types of instructions available for us to use, then we will look into what it means by assembly language syntax and also the specific assembly language instructions available on the ARM processor and finally an introduction to instruction synthesis. Some things that we should keep in mind as we go through this module. What is the difference between machine code and mnemonics? Secondly, what are the roles of the compiler, assembler, linker, and loader? And finally, what, are, what instructions are only allowed in privileged modes on the ARM? Before we dwell in into the detailed instructions on the ARM processor, we would first like to have some understanding of what makes up instruction sets. So types of instructions in the instruction set include uh, instructions for data movement, flow control, arithmetic, logic, and bit manipulation. Now we'll cover this in more detail in the coming module. Here we are just giving an overview of some of these uh, instructions. Now we also would like to understand the difference in the different uh, way we look at instruction sets. There are two domains that are of interest to us. The first is computer science which is something that we are probably more familiar with. In this domain, we are interested in the behavioral description uh, in terms of the logical or programming approach to the instruction set. And so we focus on things like mnemonics, opcodes and opruns, meaning what are the available instructions and how, what kind of opruns and op, uh, we can pass to the specific instructions. The terminology that we will use to describe all these concepts is called assembly language syntax. On the other hand, if we approach the problem from an engineering or electronic engineering perspective, we will look into the hardware aspects of the device or the microprocessor. In this case, we will be more interested in the machine code, the registers and the processor states of the microprocessor or microcontroller. Now to understand the behavior of the microcontroller, in such a case, we will rely on register transfer logic or RTL to describe the behavior of the various logic gates in the processor. So how do we go from intent into instructions? Now this process is captured in, the, in this flowchart here. Basically we are converting program logic into executable instructions to be executed on the microcontroller or microprocessor. So we first start with intent which is normally captured in something like a flowchart. The flowchart is then converted into instructions in terms of assembly language source statements and it is entered into the computer using a text editor. Now we may go through a higher level language such as C or Java or some other language first before we come out with the assembly language source code. Now this conversion from higher language source code to the assembly language source code is often done by the compiler and so uh, we may not realize that there is a conversion taking place. The second step, once we come up with the assembly language instructions, we will then use an assembler to convert it into object code. Now, because we are operating on the ARM microprocessor and often our, our personal computers are running an Intel based or some other processor, we would need to use a cross compiler which converts or compiles uh, assembly language statements for the ARM processor on a host platform. So this cross-compiler front end will generate ARM object code for the 
microcontroller that we are using. Finally, the object code will be linked into an executable program by the linker. And this executable program must then be downloaded into the next using a downloader or runtime loader program so that it can then be executed on the processor itself. So in order to write assembly language programs, we will need to know a little bit about the syntax. The syntax defines things like variables, locations in memory that holds values that we use as variables in our programs. The flow control labels define positions in the application or program that will be used to define entry points into specific blocks of code. Finally, we will need to know the specific mnemonics and instruction operands that can be used to, to define operations on the variables we have defined. And as in addition, we may also have sequences of instructions that are used repeatedly. And this can be made into macros that will be inserted into the source code whenever we invoke the macro. We will be also looking into the specific features of the new assembler. This is the assembler we will be using in this course. And in the section below, you see a highlighted uh, statement of symbolic version of a assembly language statement that includes the optional label portion, the op, the op code, which defines the instruction that we want to uh, invoke, then the operands that are associated with this opcode, which may include a destination, several source registers or source uh, operands, and finally an optional comment which describes the intent of this statement. We first look into what are labels. Labels are alphanumeric names used to identify the starting location of a block of statements and they are case sensitive, meaning that you, uh, there is a difference between lowercase a and uppercase a in a label. Secondly, they must begin with an alphabet, an underscore, a period, or a dollar sign. Now the rest of the label can be alphanumeric, meaning from A to Z, or 1, 0 to 9, including the three symbols, underscore, period, or dollar sign that, that we just described previously. Finally, the label must be followed by a colon. And Whenever we use the label in a, as a reference from another location in the program, we do not include the colon. We only use the name as defined uh, previously. Thirdly, labels must be unique. You cannot have two labels with the same name in a program. Now, there's an exception to this requirement for unique labels. Local labels are basically labels that are made up of a single numeric digit, 0 to 9, followed by a colon. These are often used in macro definitions for flow control or branch statements. And whenever the local label is encountered by the assembler, it will be converted into unique symbols. Therefore, it is actually unique, except that when we write it in the assembly language program, it is just a, a number. So the scope of a local label is until the next local label within the same digit, with the same digit is encountered meaning that if you define a local label 1, it will be unique until the next local label 1 is encountered in the program. Then, local labels are referenced by using the numeric digit followed by either a forward or backward uh, character using F or B respectively. This allows us to go forward into, into the next uh, lo a local label with the same number or else backward in the program to the local label with the specified number. Because we can use the digit 0 to 9, up to 9 different local labels can be referenced in any single direction from our current location. Next, we look at constants. Constants or immediate values will be defined following the C syntax. Decimals are specified as it is without any leading zeros. Now, binary values are often must be prefixed with a 0, B, before the actual binary digits are written down. Octals, or else uh, base 8 numbers, are prefixed with 0. Hence, decimal values should not have start with a 0 digit uh, in the number. Hexadecimals are prefixed by 0x, and then followed by the hexadecimal digits. 
And when we are writing assembly language programs, immediate operands are further prefixes by hash or a tic-tac-toe symbol, such as in the example given, at r1, r1, comma, hash 24. So how do we make use of labels in the operand view of an instruction? The first type of labels are used as branch labels, meaning that we would like to transfer execution from the current position in memory to a new location. Now, these branch labels are used without any prefixes. So, for example, we want to jump to a location done, and this is done using the uh, branch instruction B followed by the label done. The second way we use labels is if we want to reference to specific memory locations or values in memory. So, this is done using the load register uh, pseudo instruction. If we use the label as a uh, operand, we can, we can use the equal sign in front of it to reference to 32-bit literal values from the memory location. This is, uh, for example, LDR R3 equal array start. It will load the address of the variable array start from memory. The other way we can use the label is as an operand itself, where we specify the contents of the location uh, as the uh, source of the uh, operand for the instruction. So in this case, LDR R0 minval will load the contents of the address minval into register 0. We will look at a quick example of how to use all these in a short assembly language program. First, we have labels start and stop defined for this program, which defines the start position in the program as well as the end position in the program. Now these are just labels, so you can call it begin and end or some other non-reserved uh, non symbol names. So the first statement at start is the move r1 hash 0x0002000 which sets up an address pointer by initializing register r1 with the value of uh, 200 200,000 hex. Now this value is used as an address pointer to access into memory using the second instruction which is LDR R0 uh, square bracket R1 close square bracket which will load the, the contents in memory address 200,000 hex into register R0. The next instruction add would increment the value in R0 by 1. And finally we will update the contents of the variable in memory using the store instruction str to store the updated value in r0 back into memory using the address pointer in r1. And finally, the last instruction, branch stop, will cause the program to loop forever at this instruction because the instruction will continue coming back to the label stop over and over again without uh, <coughs> terminating. So what do we do with the assembly language source program? We use an assembler and assemble it into the object code. Here we are looking at the assembly language listing. Highlighted is the object code or the binary or hexadecimal values that are generated by the assembler. Now each of these 32-bit values on each line correspond to a specific instruction that we see on the right-hand side. Now the object code here is given in little endian format, meaning that the uh, because of the uh, endianness that we chosen for this uh, operating system, it implements the little endian format for the uh, output of the assembler. Here we have the disassembly output. That this assembler is actually in a different program that is used to look at the object code that is generated by the assembler and reverse compile it or reverse engineer it to give you the instructions that have been used. Now, when you disassemble the output of the object code file, you do not have all the labels and the names that we be, you used earlier. But instead, what we'll see are the raw addresses and the raw uh, values that have been compiled into the object code. Now, in the disassembly output, this uses the big endian format for various uh, values. So in other words, what you see on screen is the uh, 
the actual value of the instruction in object code or machine code format. So the first line at the offset 0, E3, A0, 1, 6, 0, 2, is the object code value for move R1, hash 2097152 decimal, which is equivalent to 200,000 hex. It is often useful to understand a little bit about the register transfer logic notation as well when we are studying assembly language programming. This is important when we are trying to debug a program and understand exactly what happens when we execute a specific instruction. In this slide, we see some syntax that is used to describe the register transfer logic notation. The first line, we have the result assignment statement. This is written such that you have the result as the destination register assigned to by the operation in involving operand 1 and operand 2 using the operator specified in the middle. So an example is R1 colon equal R0 plus R1 will be the RTL notation for the assembly language statement at R1, R0, H1. The second notation is we want to refer to the bit specific bit location in a register. We use operand, uh, open square bracket, the bit number, and the closed square bracket. This will allow us to specify a specific bit position in a given value, whether in a register or in memory. If we want to specify a range of bit values, we will use a colon to separate the starting and ending bit value of the range, such as in result, open square bracket, bi, colon, bj, close square bracket. Alternatively, if you want to refer to the contents of external memory, we use the square bracket to enclose the location of, of the address that we are interested in. And finally, a pointer will be ref uh, indicated by using the square bracket uh, and closing the address location that we is in main memory. So some examples of the RTO notation for ARM. The first example, R6 square bracket 31, indicates the most significant bit of a 32-bit register, R6, in the ARM processor. Second notation, R0. 7 colon 0 is referring to the least significant byte of register R0. The third example, square bracket R3, is referring to the use of R3 as an address pointer to point to a memory location of which the address is stored in the register R3. Finally, the square bracket 100 refers to the contents of the memory location at physical memory address 100. Decimal. Next, we will go into a quick overview of the ARM instruction set. Now, this is an overview, so we will go into each of these types of instructions in more detail in the coming modules. What are the various instructions that are available for our use in the ARM uh, microprocessor? The first are for data movement, then integer arithmetic, logic and bit manipulation, comparison, flow control and exception uh, instructions, Co-processor instructions, pseudo instructions, which are not really instructions, but they were provided for our convenience, conditional execution instructions, and finally, some mode instructions. The first group of instructions are the data movement instructions. They are prefixed normally by the word move. So we have move, move register to status, and move status to register. So the mnemonics are given in the highlighted text that you see. Related to this, we have instructions that access to memory. The first group of uh, memory access instructions are load, which is to retrieve values from memory into a register. So here we have the load register, LDR, or, and there are variants such as LDR half word, LDRH, uh, sign byte, sign half words, and byte. So you see all the different combinations and permutations of this on the slide. Similarly, to store the values in registers into memory, we have to store instructions. Here we have variants like store, store byte, and store half word. 
In addition, there are two special instructions used for implementing semaphores and other mutual exclusion primitives. They are swap and swap byte. Now, this allows us to exchange the values in a register and the contents of main memory without interruption. Another group of memory access instructions are the load multiple and store multiple instructions. These are normally used when we want to retrieve contents of a stack into our registers or the store contents of registers into the memory for preserving their values. The next group of instructions are the integer arithmetic instructions. Here we have add, subtract, reverse subtract, add with carry, subtract with carry, and reverse subtract with carry. Now don't worry about what they mean in detail, we will study them in, uh, in the next chapter. We also have multiply instructions. We have multiply and accumulate, multiply, sign and unsign, and long multiply and so for sign and unsign as well as long multiply and accumulate for sign and unsign uh, parameters. Next we have instructions that deal with logic and bit manipulation. Here we have bit clear, and exclusive or, inclusive or, as well as not which is actually defined as move negative. Now we move on to comparison instructions. Comparison instructions are special in that they perform the action without affecting the values stored in the registers. However, flag register com uh, flags will be updated to have the result of the comparison. Here we have compare, compare negative, test equivalent, and bit test. Flow control instructions are used to change the execution of the program to a different branch. Now, we can decide whether to take a branch or not depending on the status of the negative, carry, zero, or overflow flags. Now, the flags are updated whenever we perform arithmetic instructions that update the flags or else using the compare instructions. So, if you want to update the flags in an arithmetic or logic instruction, we use the S suffix added to the end of the instruction. This will then change the values of the N, Z, Z and V flags to reflect the result of this operation. We can see two examples here, add and S, add S. The add instruction does not update the flags, whereas the add S instruction will update the flags. Secondly, the interleaving of instructions that do not affect the flags can be done on the ARM front set. So in other words, we can have an add S instruction, which is then followed by an add instruction, and then perform a branch conditional branch instruction, branch if not equal, based on the result of the first add that we have performed in this sequence of three instructions shown here. So what flow control instructions are available to our for our use? The first one, of course, is branch. Branch transfer execution of the program from one location to another. The second version is called branch and link. This is used for the invocation of subroutines in a program, which allows us to jump to a different location. At the end of that subroutine, you return execution to the next instruction in the current sequence. The third option is called branch and exchange. Now, this is a unique feature of ARM processors because there is a thumb state that is uh, entered into when we use the branch and exchange instruction. Finally, we can use the software uh, interrupt or supervisor instruction to allow us to invoke the kernel mode uh, exception to take over to process certain uh, specific uh, requirements of our program. The final group of instructions are used for coprocessor uh, interfacing, but that is not a feature available in the Atmel processor that we are using in the next. So we will not spend much time on this. I'll just bring it up to highlight the available instruction set in the ARM processor that we are studying. One of the features of a complex program is the use of subroutines. Now in order to use a subroutine, we need to store temporary variables into the stack. The stack manipulation support is in one of the interesting features of the ARM processor. The ARM provides multi multiple instructions that can be used for manipulating the stack. And these are powerful instructions because it is very flexible. It can support all types of stack configurations, whether it's an ascending stack or descending stack, a full stack or an empty stack, 
and uh, that depends on the requirements of your program. Now, the AAPCS, the ARM Architecture uh, Procedure Core Standard, specifies the use of full descending stacks. So, if you want to keep compliant with other assemblers and other high level language uh, as, uh, compilers, we should implement a full descending stack in our programs. And in addition, the routines used for accessing the stack or the functions, instructions used for implement, uh, accessing the stack can also be used for memory structure access. The stack access uses the load multiple and store multiple instructions we talked about earlier. Now, for full descending stack, we will use LDMFD and STMFD as the instructions for accessing the stack. In addition to the instructions that have been studied earlier, we also have pseudo instructions that are provided by the assembler to support common usage patterns. Now, using use of pseudo instructions will decrease programming effort because they provide easily remembered mnemonics for us. Pseudo instructions are provided by the assembler to simplify the programming uh, of assembly language programs. Now, the first group of uh, pro instructions are used for specifying address locations. Here we have ADR, ADRL, which allows us to retrieve the uh, address location using the label uh, name of a speci specific memory location. In addition, we also can use LDR with the equal sign. This allows us to define the constant value in memory to be retrieved from memory into the register uh, specified. Finally, one of the most uh, obvious pseudo instructions is actually no operation or NOP. Now, in the ARM processor, there is no NOP instruction. Instead, it maps to a move R0, R0 instruction, which does not change the state of the processor. Another group of pseudo instructions are the bit shift and rotate instructions. In the ARM, there are no specific bit shift and rotate instructions. Instead, they use the uh, operand2 feature of the instruction to implement these uh, operations. However, the processor also defines uh, pseudo instructions to allow us to uh, specify these operations directly. So we have arithmetic shift right, logical shift left, logical shift right, uh, rotate right, rotate right through carry, as well as uh, for memory access to the stack we will have the more familiar push and pop uh, instructions which maps to the LDM and STM instructions specifically. A unique feature of the ARM microprocessor is the conditional execution of all ARM instructions. This means that based on the status of the flags in the status register, an instruction could be executed as specified or else it becomes a no operation. So we can specify a conditional suffix for each instruction to uh, trigger this conditional uh, execution of that instruction. So when we encounter a conditional execution instruction like move NE or move not equal, this will only take place or the operation will only take place when the instruction condition flags are having the status of not equal. In this slide, we see how the various conditional execution surfaces map to the specific flag values in the status register. In the example previously, the not equal uh, condition maps to a zero flag that is clear. On the other hand, the other values are combined in different ways to provide us different conditions such as equal, uh, higher than, lower than, and greater than, and less than. Please bear in mind that there is a difference between sign an unsigned comparison and you must use the correct version when comparing numbers whether they are assigned or unsigned. Finally we have the thumb mode. This is an extension to the 32-bit instruction set of the ARM architecture. The thumb mode is found only in T variants of the ARM architecture and this provides 16-bit instruction encoding. Now there is a thumb 2 which has additional 32-bit encoding of thumb instructions which are found in more advanced microprocessors from ARM. However, for this course, we will focus only on thumb mode. Now, thumb mode has some restrictions. You can only access the lower eight registers in most of the instructions in the instruction set. 
we can access the upper eight in registers using special instructions. And we will discuss all of this later in a uh, specific module on the thumb state or thumb mode. Here we will put all this together into an example program. First, we have an assembly directive. The dot EQ directive tells the assembler to equate the value 0x00201030 C to a label called sum. Now the instructions. We are starting at the location start and here we have a load register or LDR statement which loads the value, constant value 313A hex into register R0. Then we have another statement, load register R1, 0x, A0BB, which loads the constant value A0BB into register 1 from memory. Now we use the equal sign to indicate constant values that are stored in memory uh, for us to use. In this statement, we will use the add instruction to combine the values in R1 and R0 and the results will then be stored into R0 again. So we see the result of this calculation, 000D1F5 is the result of R0 added, added to R1 and finally the result is written back to R0. Here we will use the constant value we defined previously as a memory address pointer. So the location for sum in memory 20103C hex is then initialized into the register R2 for use as a pointer. We now store the value in R0 into memory at the address location given by R2. So at that memory location, it now contains the uh, value 0000D1F5. Now please note this is a 32-bit value. So obviously we will store it at address location starting from 20103C followed by 3D, 3E and 3F in little engine format. Finally, we stop execution by using the branch instruction to loop in this statement forever. Here we have the listing file output of the uh, instructions that we have studied earlier. As you can see, the output are in big engine format. Now we notice something interesting at the end of this uh, listing. After the stop symbol at offset 1.8 hex, we see uh, four diff uh, three different uh, constant values defined. As I mentioned previously, these are the constant values stored in memory and retrieved into the register by using the LDR instructions. So if you go back to statement 0, the first statement, we know that we see that it uses the program counter or PC as an indirect access uh, and indirect address pointer to retrieve those content from memory into the register. We now look at instruction in synthesis. Complex instructions found in CISC processors are often missing from RISC processors such as the ARM. So how do we work around this problem? We can synthesize these complex instructions using macros. For example, the ARM instruction set does not have a complement or tools complement function. So we can use the macro to define a sequence of instructions that perform an equivalent com tools complement uh, action. So in this example here, com, com, can be synthesized as move negative, which is the once complement instruction, followed by an add with the constant value 1 to give us the tools complement value. By using an instruction synthesis, we can minimize the errors that can occur if we accidentally write the instruction incorrectly, for especially the operands used for the instruction. So this allows us to have more consistent programming experience in making sure that the, what we write down in the program is correct. And this instruction synthesis technique is an important uh, technique for use in RISC microprocessor programming. So what are the trade-offs when we use macros? The advantage is that it improves readability and semantics um, much better understood. When we use the macro com, it is much more obvious what we mean rather than seeing MVN followed by at one constant. All right. So secondly, we reduces the mistyping of instruction sequences as mentioned earlier. Thirdly, 
we can modify the implementation of a given macro without changing the source code. If there is a more efficient way of implementing the complement, uh, tools complement instruction in future, we can just rewrite the macro to use those new instructions. And lastly, it is faster than a routine call because you will not need to perform stack manipulation before and after the operation itself. What are the disadvantages? Obviously, when we use a macro, we will insert the sequence of instructions into the uh, code itself. So the code size will increase if the macro is a lengthy sequence of instructions. Secondly, if the macro is implemented using different versions of a sequence of instructions, for example, one version has a debug uh, content in the macro, whereas the another version has uh, just the execution or release uh, version only, these different implementations can cause overflow in the branch offsets because the, if the number of instructions found in a given macro is, uh, is larger in one version, it may not be possible for the assembler to generate the correct branch instruction to reach the target instruction of the subsequent code. So we will end this module with some additional questions to think about. First of all, we have seen what, how NLP is supported by the assembler. How would you synthesize the NLP instruction for the ARM? Remember, one of the features of the NLP instruction is that it must maintain the current state of the processor. That no flags or no register values be changed by the execution of the NLP instruction. Secondly, how can conditional execution instructions help improve code density? How, what are the trade-offs? As you think about these things, we will study uh, more about the ARM instruction set in the next module. See you then.